Would you believe there are more slaves today than in any other time in history? Millions snatched, stolen, and held against their will. Most forced into a life of cruel, hard labor. Others into a world of prostitution. If you eat seafood, there's a good chance it was produced by slave labor. One island paradise vacationers frequent may be the hub for human trafficking. And think it doesn't go on in the US? Thousands held and working against their will right here in America. My guest today wrote a book about this epidemic and wants to talk one-on-one -on -one with Nancy Hartwell. And here we go. All right, this is one of those subjects that I can't even believe in the modern world, um, Nancy, that we're even still talking about this. How is it that human trafficking is still a problem in, in the modern world? The State Department, that isn't exactly known for being wild, uh, estimates that worldwide there are at least 30 million people living in slavery or slave-like conditions. This is more than at any other time in human history. And I thought the human race had gone beyond that by now, but guess what? We haven't. Is there a part of the world this is more of a problem uh, than other places? Yes. Southeast Asia is particularly, particularly bad. Uh, China, India, um, if you have seafood in your, your freezer from Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, or Indonesia, there's about an 80% chance that it involved slave labor. The fishing industry there is heavily dependent on slave labor. So, in other words, in these countries, Malaysia, China, they are collecting young people just for work. Is that what we're talking about? Labor slavery is far more prevalent than sex slavery, which is a big enough problem on its own. Yes, um, they send recruiters to poor countries offering unemployed young people fabulous jobs, and the families give them send-off parties because they're going to be able to send money home. <clears throat> then they get to where they're supposed to go, and suddenly all the rules change, and they, they find themselves working for n nothing. And if they don't perform, they just shove them overboard. And obviously, they, they pick somebody that needs the money. They're desperate. So then what happens? They bring them to this location. Do they house them? Do they feed them? I mean, how, how does that work? They house them and feed them just barely enough to survive and make them work all day without pay. They confiscate their travel documents, and, and they're stuck. The same thing is going on in the Persian Gulf. The... The World Cup is going to take place, the finals, in Qatar on the, the Persian Gulf in 2022. The facilities are under construction. The same idea. They go to poor countries, recruit desperate people, vulnerable people. They get there. They confiscate the travel documents, um, keep them under very close surveillance, make them work 18-hour days in 130-degree heat. The... Conditions are so bad that they have been averaging a death a day, and hardly anybody knows. Now, well, take somewhere like China or Malaysia. Do they not notice these kids in these factories or working on a fishing dock? Do they not walk by these people and go, huh, that seems odd. What is that young man or young woman doing? Many of these uh, governments are either oblivious to the problem or just turn a blind eye. Um, Thailand recently was upgraded by the State Department <clears throat> from a Tier 3 to a Tier 2 because the country is finally trying to take some measures against these predators. Um, but in other places, they just, they just don't seem to care. Um, do these kids ever try to escape, say, in these foreign countries? Do they try to run and, and, and get away? But yes, but it's really hard. When you don't know where you are, you don't know where to run to. Um, 
um, often you don't speak the language. It's it's really hard, and they keep them under very very close um, supervision. So uh, uh, there was a CNN crew that was in Cambodia um, a couple of years ago, and there was a um, a Cambodian slave who recognized one of the crew members as another Cambodian, and he talked to him and managed to escape that way. But that's, that's a wild coincidence. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's really hard. These people are stuck. What kind of crappy jobs are they making these people do? What are, what are we talking here? Well, in India, it's like mostly making bricks and and um, doing the the really hard labor jobs that most people would not voluntarily do, um, <clears throat> or in, in the fishing industry, in the um, garment industry, uh, in agriculture, in this country, it's in agriculture and in. Massage parlors and nail salons. Uh, that's that's the 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 most frequent type. It, and the State Department estimates that here in the U.S. we have approximately 200 people who are are forced into labor that they do not want to do, and but they're stuck. Now, would any of this uh, type of labor bleed over into? The factories and the garment areas and the the phone <laughs> business, like in other words, it, where iPhones are constructed or where uh, our shirts are made, are are we talking those places as, as well? Are using slave labor um, very often. Now, there's been a movement recently to try to identify manufacturers who are clean and to source only from them. But the supply chain is very long and extremely complicated, and it's really hard to be 100% sure that none of the steps of this long process involve slave labor, because very often they do. So let's take this same subject, um, human trafficking, slave labor in the United States. Does it exist here? Yes. <clears throat> What frequently happens is the coyotes, the um, people who are paid to take um, immigrants across the Arizona desert and get them into a safe place. Half the time, they take them to a slave labor camp and sell them. Um, and then these people are stuck picking green beans or or whatever. Um, that wasn't the intention. That wasn't the agreement with the coyotes at all. But these coyotes, they're not exactly upstanding citizens. Um, and I mentioned nail parlors and, and uh, massage parlors. <clears throat> the Vietnamese and Chinese in this country are extremely well organized. They have some people who are specialized in, quote, recruiting. Some who are specialized in getting business licenses to make these operations look completely legitimate. And they'll put them next to, uh, you know, a barber shop and an ice cream parlor in, in a strip mall. Um, you have other people who are specialized in breaking one of these places down in an hour in case they get word that there's going to be a police raid. Would you believe that in Canton, Ohio, this became such a problem that the police, when they would raid one of these places, would take a Chinese interpreter with them because the the girls were scared to death that the police were going to make their lives even more miserable, and they had been brainwashed to be scared to death of anybody in a uniform. Um, Yes, it exists in this country. <laughs> so in in suburbia around America, people are going to these nail salons. They are going into different businesses, maybe even a grocery store. Are you telling me then when we see these younger people working here, should we be suspicious? or? Well, you hardly ever see some of the people. Um, <clears throat> they're kept in a back room 
and they go downstairs to sleep and then and eat, then come back upstairs. Um, if they start to learn English or start to make friends, then they're immediately transferred somewhere else. Um, you may recall Mr. Kraft, the owner of the Patriots, uh, patronized <laughs> one of these places, right. and, and we're still sorting out how that's how that's going to play out. But it was an Asian massage parlor that offered additional services, right? Um, <clears throat> like usual. <laughs> but, but we don't know that the, the people in there were. Um... No, we don't. We don't okay. know. <clears throat> but there's about a fifty percent chance that that they were <laughs> right and then a lot of these um slave laborers are out in the fields right yes. california nebraska the midwest yes um do the people hiring know this when they're doing this it's all they're all part of it and they're it, all part of it yes they you know you can make a lot of money if you don't have to pay any staff right and that's what it's all about. It's just uh, uh, making money. They don't care that they're destroying people's lives. They, they're just making money. But aren't they nervous that they're going to get caught? If I'm a farmer in Nebraska, aren't I worried that, uh, you know, these laborers I'm hiring, somebody's going to see them around town or somebody's going to drive by or somebody's going to come to my farm or are, are they not? concerned about that i mean forget forget the aspect that what they're doing is wrong but are they not even concerned about getting caught um evidently not uh, it's it's hard to catch everybody and we have kind of a swiss cheese um enforcement in this country we need more of a uniform and unified enforcement system because even here in florida Different counties are stricter than than others, and if if this county cracks down, well, they just move next door, and where the, they are more lackadaisical. It's so. Is there is there a whole underground network? Like, in other words, if I needed these type of workers in my business, how would I, how would I find out about them? How do I reach these people that are? on the other side of the border to to bring me these people. How does that work? <clears throat> I I really don't know, but you probably ask 10 people and one of them would know. Um, I I do not know exactly how all of that works. Okay. Um, so how big of a problem is it then here in the United States? Is it is it do you have any numbers? Do you know? Well, State Department again estimates about 200,000 people. Now that includes the agriculture, the um, um, massage parlor, nail salon, and it includes uh, girls who have been forced into prostitution. Um, let's talk about the the sex trade, the sex slaves. <sighs> Unbelievable! How, how does that work? How how are they finding these young girls, getting them away from their families? And then, I don't know, putting them on the street or whatever in the United States. How does this work? Okay. The Internet has made recruiting a lot easier. Typically, they will post ads on sites that they know young people frequent, offering some fabulous opportunity, maybe a lucrative modeling job or a bit part in a movie or participating in a hot new band. Three M's. Movies, modeling, music. So a young person sees that and, oh, and, I'm going to be a star or something, right, whatever. Right. Okay. Whatever would turn a 14-year-old on. Gotcha. Okay? And then they go to great lengths to make the interview location look legit. Movie posters everywhere. When the girl shows up, the guy's on a fake phone call trying to pretend like he's He's casting the remake of a major Hollywood hit, you know. Right. Sounds like a bad 80s movie or something. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And then he'll ask her a question, a double-barreled question. She hears the first part, but he's really asking the second part. And this is the question. Do you have time to sit down and chat for a few minutes, or is somebody waiting for you? She's thinking, oh, he's taking me seriously. I've got a shot at this. What he's really asking is, have you come alone? 
And if she says, well, my dad had to drop something off at his karate studio, but he said he'd be back in 10 minutes, she will not get the job, unquote, um, and she will go safely back home. But if she says, oh, no, that's okay, nobody's waiting, I've, I've got all the time you need, he will actually sit down and talk with her for five or ten minutes and get her so excited she's, she's just beside herself. And then he'll say, okay, um, let me show you the studio. Well, it's a closet, and he locks her in. Wait, so he just grabs her? At the, he's, he's He doesn't even have to grab her. She's there voluntarily. and But, boom, he ushers her into the closet, and, and he, she's his. And then what happens from there? Well, if he's part of the international slave trade, he will call his broker, who is probably a member of the Russian mafia, and in an hour or so, she is drugged and in a industrial crate of some kind on an airplane, probably on her way to, the, to a brothel or harem in the Persian Gulf. Um, if he's local, he might again just call his buddy the pimp and um, and suddenly she's obligated to bring in, depending on the market, 300, 500 or a thousand dollars a day or be beaten to a pulp. So there are the so girls and is it always girls? No. Um, uh, little boys. <laughs> Are are at huge risk. There's there's just a bottomless market for pedophiles, and it's but girls are usually the prostitutes. Um, in Saint Petersburg, just a few weeks ago, they found Saint Petersburg, Florida, for Florida, everyone. Yes, right. they found two teenage boys who had been lured um, to to come to Saint Petersburg because it was going to be such a wonderful life, and they were held as sex slaves. Two teenage boys. So it's not just girls. So wait, so then they grab this person. You said they put them in some sort of container. Yeah. And then they're shipped off like a piece of cargo. Right. And right. they're off to the Middle East. Do yeah. they ever just keep them here in the U.S.? Um, it, the, the market in the Middle East is so lucrative that it's, well, let's put it this way. A good-looking young blonde can easily retail for more than $100,000. And if you have to pay a $10,000 bribe here and another $10,000 bribe there, that's just part of the cost of doing business. Ten girls, that's a million dollars. And as long as somebody is going to pay those prices, somebody will supply the market. So who is shelling that kind of money out when that cargo arrives. Who is this type of person? Is he just a guy that's turned this into a lucrative business and he's got that money? Or There are brokers who will supply the princes and the sheikhs and the harems and the brothels of anybody who has the money. One of the biggest main roads in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia is Slave Market Street. <laughs> now, to be fair, King Faisal, in 1962, issued a royal decree outlawing slavery. However, that was mostly for international consumption because under Islamic law, slavery is legal. And human law can never trump divine law. So um, slavery is still openly practiced in many places on the Persian Gulf. So in some of these countries then they are not even hiding it then no or? no they're not hiding it they don't have to it's legal so in saudi arabia they might bring somebody over uh, from the united states and not even think twice about it yeah it's just an import that's all wow that is and, so and freaking bizarre the, oh my god the scandinavian types are especially um especially prized so they have a certain look that they like. I'm, here's what I'm thinking. They want a look that's different than what they have. Absolutely. So these guys and yeah, these guys are looking for an American look, an all-American look, something oh. different from what they're used to. Blondes and redheads in, in particular, yes. But um, 
chocolate people, vanilla people, caramel people, they're all at risk. Um, um, yeah, really. Is there, like, how young are we talking? Um, okay. Nine years old is considered prime time. That is not considered pedophilia in the Persian Gulf. The Prophet Muhammad married one of his 11 wives when she was six. He waited until she was nine to have relations with her. And his favorite wife, Khadija, he married when she was nine. And so if the prophet does it, that's what you're supposed that's, to do. No, that's an interesting thing. Now, is religion part of the problem in that sense where we're still looking at, you know, they're still looking at this ancient book and going, well, it's it's in here, so it must be okay. Right. Um, it is part of the problem. Now, I hasten to add I am not anti-Muslim. I used to be married to a guy from Cameroon. Half of my family is Muslim, so but I am anti-slavery, and sometimes there is a there's a conflict. There was recently a case in Yemen where there was a 40-year-old who married an eight-year-old, and on their wedding night he attempted to have sex with her, and in the process injured her so severely that she died. Um, Jesus Christ. A piece of good news, Pakistan recently outlawed child marriage, and they are enforcing it. You can't get married now until you're at least 18, and they are enforcing it because an 8-year-old cannot give consent. I mean, legal consent. That That is another form of of almost slavery when you an eight-year-old getting they should be playing with barbie dolls not For, forget about the sexual thing what do you even talk about to an eight-year-old i i have a seven-year-old at uh, home and uh it's like two different conversations yeah well the the idea is that that females were created for one purpose and one per purpose only and you need to maximize that resource that's the philosophy behind that. Um, yeah. So is the United States cracking down on this? Do you find that in your, in your research, in your books that you've written, are you finding that the U.S. government is saying enough of this, even though Saudi Arabia is our ally, or is it looking the other way again? Well... It's a really ugly topic to bring up when you're trying to improve relations, and we've been trying to improve relations with the Arab world for the past several administrations, and this is it, it's it's usually just swept under the hand woven slave labor rug. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, uh, makes sense because we got so many other topics that this gets pushed down the list, and then right. you know when negotiations are being made on arms deals and other things, who's right. going to then at the end of the meeting go, oh, yeah, by the way, you know that shipping uh, kids back and forth that are nine years old? Uh, yeah. Could you guys um, maybe slow down on that yeah. a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's now the, the, the FBI has a special task force uh, against human trafficking, um, but it's a lot bigger <laughs> problem than what they can they can deal with and um, the State Department does come out every year with a wonderful report that gives a country by country analysis and then they they rank each country tier one tier two tier three tier four tier four is like Yemen where the government is actually part of the problem um, and and then tier one, which is mostly Western Europe and the and the U.S., where the government is trying really hard to make sure it doesn't happen, but there are always people who manage to fall through the cracks. Mm. So let's talk about uh, you know. I feel like I live now in a country where every parent. Let me let me, let me go backwards. 
I remember when I was a kid, we would just play in the street until sunrise, <laughs> till sunset, until the lights went off, the street lights right. went off. And then mom said, you got to be home for dinner when the street lights, no. When the street got, lights come on. Yeah, when the street lights come on. Yeah. Because it depended on what time of the year where I grew up. But now I feel like I live in a world where we do not let our kids out of our sight. In other words, you're almost being a bad parent. What are some of the things parents should do so their kids don't turn into human trafficked children uh, in, in America? What do, you, what do you recommend? Okay, I've got several items. Okay, there's a, an app for your phone that every parent should download. It's called Safe, Child Safe Kit. Download it. Fill it out. It wants, you know, the description of each kid, your own information, of course, any any marks or scars or anything that would identify that particular, you know, four foot, eighty pound child. Um, then they want four pictures taken at different times. A current picture, one a couple years ago, one a couple years before that, one a couple years before that so that they can do a very accurate age progression in case the child ever goes missing. They also want fingerprints and a DNA sample, um, fingernail or toenail clippings, that because the DNA lasts for 30 years. Then if the unthinkable ever happens and a child goes missing, you call 911, they put you in touch with a detective, you say, look, I participate in the Child Safe program. What is your email? And then they push a button, and all this information goes directly to the detective, who then sends it to all the agencies involved with the Amber Alert system. This saves hours of valuable time, because every hour that goes by, the kid could be another 75 miles away. And this narrows the search uh, radius dramatically. So please, child safe kit on your on your cell phone. Number two, have a family password. This is really important even for little kids because sometimes predators will go to a school when it's letting out and they'll spot a kid with something that's personalized like a baseball cap or a book bag. <sighs> Oh, Billy, look, um, your mom couldn't make it to pick you up here today, so she sent me. Billy says, what's the password? And if the guy doesn't know, Billy knows he is absolutely not supposed to leave with him. Okay? Now, the Child Safe Kit suggests that you not have personalized items for your children. But that's not always practical. I mean, a, a class of 30 kids, you've got six identical book bags. It, it makes sense to, to have them personalized. But the password will help get around that. Now, you also need to warn your kids that there are some really sneaky ways that they have devised to get around don't talk to strangers. Parents have done a decent job of teaching their kids not to talk to strangers. But... The predators know that. So, number one technique, a puppy. Oh, my puppy is lost. I think he's in those woods over there. Can you help me find my puppy? Well, what six-year-old isn't going to want to help find that puppy? I mean, we raise our kids to be kind-hearted. We raise them to love puppies, and they know this. Right. There was an interesting video on YouTube, there was a, a guy who went to a playground with a puppy, and he asked parents, can I try to get your child to leave with me? And parents said, ha, 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 lots of luck, because um, she, she was not going to leave with you. She knows not to talk to strangers. Guess what? Eight out of eight kids left with him. Walking along beside him, skipping, holding his hand. This is not how we imagine a kidnapping, but it could have been. He just wanted to illustrate how easy it is to get around, don't talk to strangers if you have a puppy. And he promised to show them more puppies, and that's why they were 
gaily leaving with him. So, parent, remind your kids, even if he has a puppy, you need to think, wait a minute, I don't know this guy. This is a stranger. Okay, please, parents, monitor your kids' social media sites. There are predators lurking out there pretending to be another 11-year-old playing that online game. And a lot of these games now, you can communicate with the other players. We're, ta- we're, we're talking uh, video games uh, that they're playing live with someone else. Right. Anywhere on, around on the, the... On the Internet. Okay. And if the, the kids need to know that if it starts acting a little bit weird, like, send me a picture of yourself without any clothes on, duh, it's probably not another 11-year-old. And... They should know to tell mommy or daddy immediately, if not sooner. <laughs> and then work with your kids. You don't, you don't want to be the mean policeman, but sit with your kids and show them websites that have lots of red flags or pictures that never in a million years should have been posted on the on the Internet. Um, girls, I know this sexting thing. When you're 15, it seems innocent enough. But don't do it. When you're 40 years old and you want to run for mayor, guess what? That guy probably still has those pictures. And he can blackmail you. So don't even think about sending anything that you wouldn't want on the front page of a newspaper. Oh, that's a good way to look at it. Because it's going to be around for a while. It's going to be around for a while. And some of these pictures are supposed to, quote, disappear. But there are ways around that. And so don't take the risk, please. And runaways are at such high risk. They have targets on them the size of Texas, and predators can spot them at 50 paces. So if you know a kid who's even thinking about running away from home, home might be hell. I understand, but they haven't known what hell is until they're on the streets. And these predators will go to a park or a bus station or a train station looking for potential victims and they'll be so nice. And they'll promise everything the kid needs, like a safe place to sleep, a hot meal. Oh, yes. <clears throat> and then after a couple days, okay, now you owe me big time here. And boom, uh, they lower the boom. Um, another way that predators get around, don't talk to strangers, sometimes they work in pairs. One creates a problem, and then this hero solves it. Like there was this girl on a bus, and a guy sits down next to her starts groping her. She gets mad. He gropes her again. She gets even madder. So this other passenger in, who sees what's going on comes over, tells that guy to leave his hands off the kid, puts him in another seat. Then he sits down next to her. Did you ever tell your kid not to talk to heroes? Within 30 seconds, he can extract from her all the information he needs, where she's going, is somebody going to be there to meet her. Um, the, these are really insidious ways of getting around. They try to break the stranger barrier right, and then move in for the kill. So then are these children we're talking about in this type of situation, are they then always moved out of the country or sometimes they remain here? No, they often remain here um, and, you know, bring me $300 tomorrow and, you know. You can have yourself a kid. You, yeah, yeah. You, or sometimes they, they target particular individuals. Um, they will follow them. Okay. I know what bus you take. I know where your daughter goes to daycare. Um, If you ever want to see your daughter again, you're going to do what I tell you. So do you think a lot of these predators all across the country are just sitting there at bus stops or 
kid-friendly places and just kind of scout in the area? Do, do you they think that's... often do that, or uh, at a mall? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how they that's how they find their victims. They're looking for people who are vulnerable. But I would think like a mall with so many cameras around that they would just be. They would just, you know, these predators would like to stay away from these areas because if they do nab a kid at a place like this, they're going to they're at least going to be spotted. Yeah. But see, they get the kid to leave with them voluntarily. They I mean, it's not grabbing a kid and running away. Right. That would be way too obvious. But they have a very smooth techniques of getting a kid to leave with them voluntarily. Yeah. Yeah, I think this has just become like <laughs> every mom's and, and dad's. I, I, we, I, I just feel like we are so now fearful in this country that and, and maybe this is the answer. You just don't ever let your kid, you know, get out of your sight. Um, I, I, and I agree with you educating your kids on, on what they need to do. But I feel like we're just uh, getting to a point where. We are just scared of any stranger coming up and talking to little Billy or little Susie. You know, it's just, um, it's a lot different than the 1950s. Yeah, well, um, in some countries, it's a lot worse. (laughs) Uh, I had a friend who went on vacation in Morocco with her husband and her nine-year-old daughter and six-year-old son. And they were in Casablanca walking down a street and... And the nine-year-old wandered maybe 20 feet away from them. A guy grabbed her, and they and took off with her. They went to the police, and the police said, "Oh yeah, sorry about that. That happens." Um, also in Morocco, my sister had a friend who was there on her honeymoon, and they were in the souks, and he wanted to look at one thing. She wanted to look at something else. So she. They said, okay, meet you back here in five minutes. Well, she didn't come back. And fortunately, he knew where she was headed, and he went behind that souk, and there she was, bound and gagged. It took two hours to get her back, but he finally finally succeeded. Um, So um, in some countries, it's, it's a lot worse. We don't want to be paranoid. But we do need to alert our kids that there is a danger. We tell them not to cross the street without looking both ways because there's danger. We tell them not to put their hands on a hot stove because there's danger. But for some reason, we're reluctant to talk to them about this because we don't want to traumatize them. Right. But in fact, we're putting them at additional risk because they aren't aware of the dangers. So um, please do talk to them. The Child Safe Kit has some good tips about about how to talk to your kids about about this issue without traumatizing, just alerting them that they're not everybody in this world is is well intentioned. I, I would would microchipping children solve this problem tomorrow if we had a chip in every human being that was born? Um, then um, we could track them and find them, or it would probably help. Um, in in a lot of countries, even getting a birth certificate is complicated, and a lot of girls grow up without a birth certificate. Um, but here in the United States, specifically, I'm talking about if we put a microchip in every baby was born, <laughs> when that child starts disappearing, we would know where they're at. Correct. Well, it would it would make it a lot easier to track them. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But we got to convince the everyone to put a microchip in. We can't give people to do that with their dogs and cats. So right. How how successful is that going to going to be, Nancy? Good plan. I'll, I'll get in. I'll get right on that. Um, I understand that the Russian mafia is very intertwined to the slave trade. Am I wrong on this? Um, you are unfortunately correct. And these guys are professional criminals. They know all the techniques, and you do not want to mess with them. Um, They used to just operate in Russia and Eastern Europe, but they noticed a vacuum, and so now their tentacles are absolutely everywhere. Um, The 
the principal place in the Western Hemisphere that they operate is Aruba. Aruba has three major industries. Wait, wait. The Aruba, we're like where I've gone on vacation. Yes. They have three major industries. Number one, drugs. Number two, human trafficking. And number three, tourism. Okay, so then how is Aruba connected? Uh, wh how do they use Aruba in that way? It's a staging center. Um, that's where they, they t take um, potential victims, and, uh, and it, it's just their, their headquarters for the, for the Western Hemisphere. You might remember a case a few years ago, um, a, a student from Alabama <coughs> who disappeared in Aruba, um, We're not talking Natalie Holloway. See, yes. Um, and she fit the profile precisely, you know, blonde, blue-eyed, cute. Um, and the guy that they had originally questioned regarding her, her quote, murder, but they never found her body, he, he told Greta Van Susteren that that he had sold her to an Arab who worked in the oil industry in Venezuela right next door. Um, makes perfect sense because nobody ever found her body. She fit the profile to a T, and this guy was a professional lowlife. Anyway, he's doing time in Peru right now because he got in trouble there for some other nonsense. That's not the Vandersloop guy, is Vander, it? Vandersloop, yes. Yeah, because he grabbed another girl, brought her up to a hotel, if I remember the story right. I might not have it right, but I remember there was video of him bringing a girl up, and then she never left the hotel. Right, right. Um, he was a, a lowlife, for right. sure. Yeah. So wait, now, do you think he was conspiring to get her into the slave trade then? Maybe, probably. He could make some money. He could make some money, yeah. Um, um, but but you really need to be careful because these, uh, first of all, the mafia, they're not known as being very tenderhearted. Um, and, and they are professional criminals. They know every technique in the book, and they've invented a whole bunch themselves. Yes. Aruba. Aruba is a <laughs> main point for this. That's unbelievable. Great yes. for the tourism department there, right? Yeah. Well, I had a, a real selling point. Yeah. <laughs> come, come to Aruba and right, right. give up your child. Right. I had a friend who went to Aruba um, for vacation, and when he came back, the immigration guys at the airport grilled him and grilled him, and he didn't understand why. Until I explained, oh, well, they want to know every place he went. Every, um, I think they thought he was dealing drugs, but, but, um, which is the number one industry. And by the way, human trafficking after illicit drugs is the biggest criminal enterprise in the world. It's a multi-billion dollar international industry. After... Illicit drugs. It's number two. See, I've, uh, go back to that Natalie Holloway for a sec. I forgot the story, too. They never found the body, right? No. This was in, I think, 2006. And he never said what he did. Well, he he told 25 different, different stories. Different stories. So they don't right. know. Is there a possibility she just could have been sold off somewhere and still alive? Well, he said that he had sold her to an Arab who worked in the oil industry in Venezuela right next door. That was one of his stories. That was one of his stories. And it's the only one that ever made any sense. And they obviously went and checked with that person and who what, knows. What, what, are you, what are you going to do? I mean, Arabs keep their wives secluded. <laughs> right, right. And you can't go into a harem and start ripping yeah, you, off veils. You, and, you can't just bust into the house uh, now right, in, right. A, in an Arab home and kick down the door and say, where, where we're is gonna, she? We're yeah. going to search your harem. Yeah. Right. right. Harem, in fact, it's the, the Arab word for forbidden. Uh, harem is a forbidden place. Nobody is allowed to go there except the people who live there. Let's talk a little bit about what uh, these people that become human slaves somehow escape it. Somehow the frickin' they get away and they try to get back to normal life. Can, can they return back to normal life? They can return to some semblance of normal life. I used to work with a, 
a shelter in Baltimore that rescued girls from the street and then tried to rehabilitate them, give them a high school education, some employable skills. Um, and it is really tough because imagine you're 13 years old and people <clears throat> have lied to you, deceived you, betrayed you, exploited you so many times times and at such an impressionable age that you never ever really get over it you learn how to cope but you're scarred really for for life um and that's what makes this crime so tragic is that it really destroys people's lives they steal you they steal your dreams they they steal your future they steal you away from your family, from everything that you've known and loved. And and it's just a horrible, horrible crime. You've been talking about this for a lot of years. I know you've written a lot of books. I know you appear on a lot of media about this. How did how did this be how did this journey begin for you? Okay. <clears throat> well, I mentioned before my husband was from Cameroon and when I was living there, I lived there for 14 very nice years, <clears throat> um, I had a German friend named Ursula who just disappeared. They found her bicycle next to the road, but no Ursula, and nobody has heard from her or seen her since. Several weeks later, we heard rumors that were probably true that she had been sold to a sultan in Libya. And that spooked me really bad because 50 years ago I was pretty cute blonde myself and I kept thinking holy Toledo that could have been me and so I started collecting stories and over the years I've collected hundreds and hundreds of of stories and these are what my books are <clears throat> based on or these true stories they are faction. Um, now, they're classified as fiction because I don't have copies of police reports and dates and all of that, but they these are true stories that I collected over nearly 50 years, and and so that's what my three books are, are based on. The flagship book of the Human Trafficking series is called Harem Slave. It has been translated into French, German, and Spanish. At one point, I'm very pleased to say, it reached number seven in all fiction on Amazon. That's of more than three million titles. And it has also won an award. Then there's a, a sequel called Prince Ibrahim's Favorite. It also won an award. Um, it's currently being translated into French. And... Um, then there's a companion volume to that called Voices from the Harem. Those are the three. They're available on uh, my website and through Amazon. My website, by the way, nancyhartwell.com, there's a five-part course on modern-day human trafficking and uh, 21st century slave trade. All we need is your email address, and it's absolutely free. We just want as many people to know about this as possible. It's, you know, the extent of the problem, the different forms that slavery takes in the world today, um, what people can do to help combat it. Um, please, um, you're, you're welcome to sign up for the course on the website. Just click, um, click on the icon and download it. Yeah. Do you think we will ever see a day where this will become a real little problem, or is this always going to be with us? I think it's always going to be with us. I mean, we've outlawed murder. It hasn't stopped murder. Um, um, I, I'm afraid it will always be w with us because it's just too, too good a way to make money. And there are always people that that don't care that they're destroying other people's lives. They just want to make money. Yeah. 
Well, Nancy, interesting stuff. I'm uh, I'm fascinated. Um, I have a son. I'm going to watch him even closer now that I've talked to you. Now he's never going to go outside in the backyard and play. Uh, I feel like I now live in a country where um, you can't trust anyone. But I hope that's not true. No. <clears throat> We're we're much safer than in most countries. I've done a lot of traveling. I've been to 45 countries, including 14 in Africa and 14 in Asia, and um, we're we're in a, a very safe country for the for the most part. Um, um, don't get paranoid, um, but but take precautions. Yes. All right, Nancy. We're out of here. <laughs> Thanks so much, Randy. No more roach on Florida TV.